Good morning. Good morning. Wonderful morning that we've been blessed with. And we so appreciate each and every one of you being here. I appreciate the opportunity that I've been given to introduce my son. In whom I'm well pleased. Just real quickly, and then I'll let him do his task that he loves to do. I want to share with you something that um, touches me. Years ago, my wife and I, as we were expecting our first child, Sue had diabetes. She was in a frightening condition with uh, this first child and they warned us, they said that they weren't sure how his lungs would develop if they even would. So on a day that we went up to have some tests run to see how he was doing, the doctor came in, she checked my wife over and then she quickly left the room. She came back and said, we're taking him now, which was way too early. I was scared to death. Sue was scared to death. They decided to take him cesarean, so they take us in, they prepped and got us in this room, which seemed like days, it was a matter of hours. And they had this sheet up and they're working on Sue and Sue's holding my hand and I'm there supposedly supporting her. You know how we do, man. <laughs> I wasn't supporting anything. She was holding me up from falling into the floor, but I didn't want to tell her that I'm the man. <laughs> and she said, what's going on? And I said, I don't know, I can't see anything. I see them working. I don't know what's going on. And she could tell they were tugging around. And all of a sudden I saw them carry a baby by the feet over this table. He wasn't moving. They begin working on him and working on his taking stuff out of his mouth. And I heard that first voice. He let out a scream. And he hasn't shut up yet. <laughs> And I'm so happy. I am so happy. At the age of nine, and I'll try to speed this up, we went to the lectureships at West Virginia School of Preaching. And while there, he was nine years old. You know how nine-year-olds are. They're sometimes just kind of running around. Sometimes they get tired during an hour-long lecture and they'll fall asleep. After the first lecture, he jumps up, he takes toward the front of the building. And my wife says, uh, where's he going? And I said, probably trying to find the restroom and he's lost, it's back here, I'll go catch him. And I saw him dart in the front of the building with the f several older fellows, preachers. And he ran out to shake the hand of Denver Cooper, Gene West, and Emmanuel Darty and others, he informed his mom and I that day, he said, I want to be a preacher. And he did. We have been encouraged by him ever since. He's preached at Wileyville, Eight Mile, Pine Grove, Duffy, Steelton, Proctor, Seven Hills, Salem, Kent. And he's just getting ready to turn 18. He's been going part-time to the West Virginia School of Preaching and he was uh, filling in for me one evening before camp and we all took off and went out to camp and there's an elder that's quite picky from the, or was an elder years ago, quite picky from the congregation up here that supports the School of Preaching in Moundsville. And after he filled in for me on a Sunday evening, we went out to camp and I get a phone call Monday morning from Andy, the director. And I'm in the lunchroom trying to hear Andy and he said, 
I got a call from, and he mentioned this older fellow's name. This older fellow's pretty picky. And preachers, if you ever preach before him, you better cross all the T's and dot the I's. Because he'll talk to you in the Mac. He's strict. He wants God's word preached. And Andy told me that this man had went to the elders, and I thought, what happened now? <laughs> what did I do wrong? And when Andy told me, he had this voice that I'm having, choked up, he said he wanted to know why Rod was not allowed to start the school this year. That impressed me. Because I realized that yes, we might see some of our older brethren being nitpicking. You love us. And you want us to do what's right. And thank you. I'll let him do his job. I'm not sure how long I'm allowed to speak. I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think the uh, the announcement thing says to I think 12, t 12 10, something like that. So we got some time still. Hey, Ray, you and Ken, you do what you please. <laughs> but I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak here this this morning. It is truly an honor. I've number one, I've never been to a men's retreat. So first of all, thank you for inviting me to this. And number two, thank you for inviting me to speak here at this. It is truly an honor. This morning's sermon, Faith Prize Fighter. If some of you might remember a man by the name of Muhammad Ali and others that never knew of him, Google it or look, up, look it up on YouTube because that's what I did. Um, but look up some of these this fighter's name. Look at his name and look at what he was able to accomplish in his fighting career. He was able to do many things. He was nicknamed the greatest because he went, I believe, 31 and 0 for a long time. 31 fights he fought that he never was beaten. And zero he lost. Up until one point. But he was the greatest. But did that happen just overnight? Did that happen just overnight where he just woke up one morning and thought, I, could, I'm, I think I'm going to go punch some people. And then he, he thought, yeah, okay, and this is fun. I'm going to make a job out of it. Last night I got to see some of the playoffs for the NBA playoffs. And I got to see uh, the, uh, the Golden State Warriors. And they won. But did that just happen overnight? Did that team wake up uh, two nights before and say, you know, I, th I don't think we're going to get practice today. I, let's, just, let's just stay here and let's eat a bunch of junk food and just kind of relax on the couch, you know, and just stay here and let's not work at anything. No, that's not what they were doing. I'm sure that's not what they were doing. They were working diligently, training in order to win this game. With this game, this series, this whole thing. And they are looking forward to the finals. Whenever we think about faith's prize fighter, all athletes must train in order, in order to, to win the battle, to win this game. They train themselves before the actual event takes place. Everyone must be taught the fundamentals before they go to this event. Number one, the, the football players, they need to learn the fundamentals. Passing, tackling, blocking, the basketball players, shooting, passing, and defense. And for fighters, punching and blocking and moving around. Whenever we think about as the Christian, as faith's prize fighter, as the Christian, we must be taught the fundamentals about being faith's prize fighter. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul there is saying, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, that whenever I should preach the gospel, I should not become disqualified. He brings his body into subjection. We as Christians, spiritually speaking, we should want, have to, we should have to train our spiritual bodies in the way that is pleasing to God, that we must be ready for anything. Whenever we think about Paul's teaching, if, as in the reading, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 <coughs> speaks about 
these things. Paul here is teaching us three fundamental things this morning of how to fight the good fight of faith. Number one, if you turn in your Bibles to the reading, if you still have your Bibles open to there, if we look there in the verse, it says the first thing, fight the good fight of faith. Fight. The first thing that he's teaching us, the fundamental things of how to learn how to become faith's prize fighter, that's the first thing that he teaches us. Whenever we think about this, we think about fighting with offense. We fighting with whenever we fight with offense, we shouldn't fight as one who beats the air. If we go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and it, instead of going to verse 27, back up a little bit to verse 25. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air. Then he goes into that verse, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Right there, he's speaking about fighting with offense, not as one who beats the air. Have you ever, you've heard of shadow boxing, right? Shadow boxing. And whenever you think about shadow boxing, what is it? Are you accomplishing much other than just training your body to punch? No, you're not really. You don't know how someone's going to move whenever you come around with a swing. You don't know how they're going to react to that. You're just swinging into nothing. That's what beating the air is. But in Faith's prize fighter, we shouldn't uh, fight with offense as one who beats the air. We should, every, we should make sure that every effort that we put forth ought to sink in every effort that we have, we should make sure our efforts as proclaimers of the gospel are not in vain. Brothers in Christ, here in Kent, as we are here in Kent, as you go home to your own congregations, to your own towns, and to your home cities, to home states, make sure that whenever you put forth an effort, put forth such an effort that they should not be in vain. Put forth such an effort that whenever you fight the good fight of faith, everyone knows that you are a faith prize fighter. Also, not as one who beats the air, we should fight with offense using our greatest weapon. What is our greatest weapon? Well, we find here, turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 12, speaks about our greatest weapon. In verse 12, it says this, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you. Again, the first print, print I'm in, first, I'm in chapter 5. First, uh, chapter 4 in verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and are piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and joints of, and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God. The Word of God is the sharper than any two-edged sword. We think about our greatest weapon. When fighting with offense, we use our greatest weapon. This weapon will convict. It convicted the people at Pentecost. It convicted men. It convicted all of you at some point. If we find, we find that in Acts chapter 2 and verses 36 through 38, where the Jews were there. They were all there. And Peter said in verse, in verse 36, This Jesus whom you crucified is, both, is now made Lord and Savior. Then, in verse 37, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Or we're less saying, We killed our Savior. We killed the One. We killed the Son of God. The One who was going to save us. We killed Him. What are we going to do? Then what did Peter say in verse 38? He said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father. You see what that is? We find here that this weapon will convict the soul. It will convict our minds, our whole being, into knowing the truth. Yes, right. This weapon will stand the test of time. It is the best, this book is the best-selling book in the world. It is the best-selling book in the world. It is the book, this is a book that none, uh, unlike 
any other book on earth. Because in this, this book holds truth. Yes. This book holds wisdom. Yes. This book holds our eternal life. Amen. We need to lay hold of it, as we'll find in a moment. But first, not only should we fight with offense, but fight with defense. Guard what has been given to us. If we turn back to the reading in 1 Timothy chapter 6, skip on down a few verses to verse 20. <coughs> it says, O Timothy, Peter, or Paul here is saying to Timothy, O Timothy, guard what has been committed to your trust, avoiding the profane and idle babblings and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. By professing it, some have strayed concerning the faith. Grace be with you. Amen. Guard what has been given to us. Guard what has been given to us. We should cherish, cherish this book to the point that we live it. This book should be connected to us. Connected to us to the point that whenever someone starts off on some other tangents, these idle babblings, we should make sure that this book is connected to our minds so much that we are lie detectors. <laughs> that we are lie detectors in that point. That we should be to that point. Whenever we think about guarding what has been given to us, man will always try to take away something good and replace it with evil. Think about words that we know. Think about how many words are bad words now that used to be good words. Think about that. Another thing, we have something that is more of more value than anything on earth, which is salvation for our souls. Salvation for our souls. Salvation was a mystery to the prophets. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And in verse 9, we'll start. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that, is, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but whenever I became a man, I put away childish things. Now we see dimly. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. We find here the part. You think about a pie. I love pies, as you can see. I love pie. And if you think about an apple pie, that's a good American pie right there, you know. But if you think about a pie, an apple pie, you'll see a, a full apple pie. And you take a chunk out of it and you put it on a plate. Is that piece that you just took from that, is that going to be an apple pie? Yes, in part. It's not going to be the whole part. It's not going to be the whole of it. That's what it's talking about here. And the men in the Old Testament, they were getting the piece of the pie. But they weren't getting the whole pie. They were awaiting to see what was what that shadow was. Yes, or Thursday, I was in class and we were talking about how the church, the church in the Old Testament was a shadow. The church is the is the substance, and in the Old Testament it was the shadow, the type, anti-type. You might know, anti-type. That's what it was. We think about this. We think about that we are to guard what has been given to us, the salvation. It was a mystery to the prophets. It was something that they saw in a mirror. If you've ever been, you know what a mirror is like whenever you've taken a shower or something and then it's all foggy, right? You get out and you see the mirror is foggy. You can't see yourself clearly. You can see that there's an outline of you in there, but you can't see you clearly. But you wipe away the mirror. You can see yourself clearly. That's what Christ did. Christ wiped away that mirror. Wiped away that mirror in the way that we could see face to face the, the will of God. We could see face to face salvation. Look it square in the eye and know that we can have salvation. Also, salvation is something that angels desire to look into. That's a whole other sermon right there. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12 speaks of that. But we know that uh, angels desire to look into salvation. Shouldn't we want to look into salvation? Shouldn't we want salvation from our sins? 
guard what has been given to us, but also guard with what has been given to us. What has been given to us? Well, the Lord is our shield. If you turn in your Bibles to Psalm chapter 3, or the third Psalm, the third, in the third Psalm we find something here. We find David is speaking about the Lord. In Psalm 3, the third Psalm, it says in verse 1, Lord, how they have increased who trouble me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who, stay, or who say of me, there is no help for him in God. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me from his holy hill. I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have struck all my enemies on the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon your people. Right there is the whole point. The Lord is our shield. The Lord is my shield. The Lord is your shield. That's where we get our defense from. The next point that we find in the verse, in 1 Timothy chapter 6, in verse 12, it says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold. That's what the next point is. Lay hold on truth. Not only on eternal life, which we'll speak of in a, little, in a moment, but lay hold on truth. We must let go of some things, though, beforehand. If I were here, and whenever I got here, we were setting this stuff up. And whenever we were setting this stuff up, if we would have needed to move the table, move that table somewhere else, and I had this in my hand, and I had a songbook in my hand, and I had this and everything, and someone said, Rod, can you come over here and pick the other end of this table up and move it with me to this way? And I walked over and I grabbed, I tried to pick it up with my Bible in my hand, the songbook, and this. Could I handle that very well? I might be able to pick it up, but it's not going to be very stable. That table's probably going to end up on the floor earlier than what we were thinking about it. But what I needed to do was what? Lay down my Bible, lay down the songbook and my iPad, lay it down so I can have both hands to pick up that table. That's what we needed to do. That's what we need to do in faith, in our lives, in our spiritual lives. Lay down the things. Let go of the lies. Let go of the temptations. Let go of the false teachings. And so you can completely lay hold on truth. Christ came to bear witness to the truth. John 18, 33-38 speaks of that. But we must hold tight to the truth which has been given to us and has proven itself. It proves itself time and time again. All the time this book does. The next thing, not only lay hold on truth, but lay hold on eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life. Whenever you think about laying hold of something, grasp it tight. If you lay hold of something, you don't want to let go of that. You keep it to the point that you're not going to let go of that with anything, for anything. We need to lay hold on eternal life. Fight the good fight of faith. If you go back to the reading, and if you go on up in a little, for a little bit, in verse, um, in verse 11, it says, But you, O man of God, flee these things, which he's talking about the things in the previous verse, which is greediness and things like that, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. Then he says in this verse, the same verse that we're going over, fight the good fight of faith, Lay hold on eternal life. We need to pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and patience and gentleness. Then we need to lay hold on eternal life. Grasp it tightly. Keep a hold of it. That's what we need to do. Let Never let go of the only life giver. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6. John chapter 6. <clears throat> In John chapter 6, we see a scene in the Bible. 
we see something happening that is sad at first, but then we find something else. In John chapter 6, in verse 6, 60 starting, says, Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? <clears throat> is it the Spirit who gives life? For or the flesh profits nothing. It is the Spirit, I'm sorry. The words that I speak to you are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. Then right here is the very sad point right here of this whole section. It says in verse 66, From that time many of his disciples, that is followers, went back and walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, he turned around, you can see this scene, he saw them walk off and abandon the teachings of the Lord. And you can see him turn around to the twelve and say, do you also want to go away? Then here's Peter. We talked about Peter a little bit ago in one of the other sermons, the other lessons. But here's Peter. The ups and downs of faith, is, I believe, is what this whole thing is called. Well, the ups and downs of faith in Peter's life, well, they were up and down a lot. But right here we see but Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Right there, it makes it all visible. You can see it. Never let go of the only life giver. Simon Peter was saying that. Lord, we have nowhere else to go. You have the words of eternal life. We're not going to get away from you. We're not going to walk away. We're not going to walk away from this opportunity to live in heaven with you. That's what Peter was saying. The next point and the last point, if you go back to the reading, it says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life to which you were also called and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Confessed the good confession. Confess is the last point to see this morning. <clears throat> Number one, confess who we are. Well, who are we? Well, I'm Rod Goddard and you're Isaiah Leinecker and we go back through the room, but that's not who we are. We can know who we are, spiritually speaking, even more than we know who we are physically here. We can know, our, we can know this book better than we know our name our own name. Confess who we are. Well, who are we? We are followers of Christ. We are the followers of Christ. We follow Christ in His footsteps. Christians. If you take Christ out of Christian, what do you have? You have I-A-N, I am nothing. Amen. Without Christ, I am nothing. That's who we follow. We are followers of Christ. We are chosen people. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verses 9 through 10 speaks of that. A, cho a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a holy nation. That's what it, it's talking about. But not only should we confess who we are, but we should confess why we are here. Why are we here? What do we fight for? Why are we here in this face fight? Well, what do we fight for? We fight for the prize of the eternal crown. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verses 6 through 8 speaks of that. And Peter, or Paul, I keep calling him Peter, but Paul said, this is toward the end of his life, for I am ready to be, or for I am being poured out as the drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, but not only to me, but to all who have loved His appearing. Brothers in Christ, that is you and me. That, that is you and me. What He had said there, to all who have loved His appearing. 
we can inherit that crown, that crown of righteousness if we endure to the end. Confess, in confession, what, what do we fight for? Well, we fight for the prize of eternal life. John 3, 15 through 17. We know chapter, chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Everlasting life. That's what we can have if we endure to the end. Also, another question I would like to ask you, what, why fight through the hard times? Well, number one, our Savior fought through the hard times. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, what, what did He do? Endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He endured the cross for who? For his, his mother and his brothers, right? Well, them, yes, but not only them. Well, he endured the cross for who? You and me and all of these people out here that are not in here right now. All of these people that we see at Walmart, at whatever store you go to, he died for them. He endured the cross for them. Shouldn't we endure our crosses? Whenever Christ said, take up your cross and follow me, shouldn't we have the endurance to take up our crosses and follow Christ. The last question I would like to ask you this morning, why even stay in the fight? Why even stay in this? We cannot throw in the towel, as you might see in some of the movies, like uh, Rocky or something like that. You can't throw in the towel in this faith prize, or in this faith prize fight. You can't do it. Acts 4 and verse 18 through 20 speaks of that, but not only there, but John chapter 6 and verses 65 through 69 speaks of that. We read that a, little, a moment ago where Peter was saying, to whom shall we go? We, you Only you have the words of eternal life. We can't give up that. We can't give up the eternal life. We can't throw in the towel on that. We must fight until death. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10 speaks of that. So we have found this morning that Paul is teaching us three main things, not only in this verse, but in his life. Number one, fight. Number two, fight. Number three, fight. We fight when we want to give up. Fight. When everyone is against us, when the world is coming upon us and we are surrounded by the world, fight. That's right. When the memories of sin haunt us, like it did Paul throughout his ministry, it haunted him, we fight. We keep on fighting. Then we can inherit that crown of righteousness. We have learned the fundament fundamentals of how to fight the good fight of faith. Now is the time to fight. Thank you for your attention. Amen. Good You would turn your song books to number 446. Thank you, Isaiah. Thank you, Rod. Some things I, I think you need to know. When we came up with this idea of the young men speaking, I started asking people if they would be willing to do that. Isaiah came up and said, Okay, guys, so let's do this on faith. So Isaiah came up with the thought. 